Do you believe that Jesus took your sin and took my sin and took it to the cross and down into death? And that's why I'm standing here this morning because the cross sets us free from the past. of our sin and I'm going to say past, present and future now that's not a license to sin it's all the more reason why we don't want to sin because we love him because I'm in Christ and this great priest this redeemer has passed into the heavenly tabernacle he now represents you and me in the presence of the Father. And His perfect, potent, powerful, shed blood was accepted by God Himself. as a high priest of the good things that have come, even though the greater and more perfect tent, he entered once for all into the holy place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies the purification the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to god purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living god therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promise eternal inheritance since a death has occurred which redeemed them from the transgression under the first covenant for where a will is involved the death of the one who made it must be established for a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive hence even the first covenant was not ratified without blood. For when every covenant of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites but the heavenly things themselves 
with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place yearly with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And thus, as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. For since the law has been but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices, which are continually offered year after year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? If the worshippers has once been cleansed, they would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sin year after year. Hear the words of the Holy Bible. And just in case I say the wrong thing, before we turn to the word, Father, I thank you for those words softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. I thank you for the day you call me. And I ask, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will lead us through this time. You will cause us to be focused have our attention on your wonderful word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you know uh, from the middle of chapter 7 uh, through to the middle of chapter 10, it's all about the blessings of the new covenant. And that was my subject two weeks ago here. Uh, and this morning, um, Catherine read to us from chapter, primarily from chapter 9, and that continues that theme and that discussion of the great transformation that Jesus, our high priest, has not gone into a man-made tabernacle, he's gone into the heavenly tabernacle. And he's appeared there for us. I get so excited about the fact there's a man in the glory. And his name is Jesus. He's the first man to ever enter glory. But he goes there as one who has fulfilled all the demands of a holy God. He paid the price in full. Now, you know, there was a, a church being built in England, and you know how high the ceilings are in some of those churches, and, and, um, and many of those churches were sort of built out in paddocks. If you go down to Carmetta Cup down in the southwest here, you, you'll, you'll see that for yourself, that out among the sheep. And these guys were building. These guys were building. And there was no... Uh, safety measures like there is now. And one of them, right high up, he slipped and he fell. And fortunately, 
as he fell, there was a flock of beautiful fat lambs, woolly fat lambs, walking underneath. And he fell directly on one of these lambs. And the gravitational speed of his body killed this lamb, but saved him. And I want to tell you this morning, if I don't tell you anything else, that our dear Saviour, in all his loveliness and all his wonder and all his holiness, he took the full blow of sin. Do you believe that Jesus took your sin and took my sin and took it to the cross and down into death? Amen? Now very often in counselling and at other times we find people that are frustrated because they don't believe that. He took the full blow of our sin, and I'm going to say past, present, and future. Now, that's not a license to sin. It's all the more reason why we don't want to sin. Because we love him. But we have our ups and we have our downs and we have memories that hurt us. And we have been betrayed by a lover, maybe. We have hurts and we have regrets and we have bitterness. We have fears and we have hang-ups and things that hold us back from serving God with a full heart. You remember the children of Israel in their early travels. They came to this place, I think it was called Mara, and there were the bitter waters and they couldn't drink. And they couldn't return because all their enemies had been drowned in the Red Sea by the power of God. But they couldn't go forward because they were thirsty and they couldn't drink the water. And God showed Moses a tree. Now I believe that was a type of the cross. And he said to Moses, throw that tree into the bitter waters. And those waters became sweet. And I was at a camp one time and listening to uh, a dear man, some of you probably know his name, and he said to all the young people, all the young people that were there, take the cross into your life and it will sweeten your life. It will change things. Now, if we go back and read that story, we haven't time to now, of course, but they moved on to a place where there were several springs and there were beautiful pine trees because they got rid of the bitterness. They came to the cross, I believe. And the bitterness and the regrets and the unforgiving spirit and all that sort of stuff that plagues us was dealt with there at the cross. I want to tell you something. I know what it is to get to a stage in my life where I feel better. I remember when I was first in ministry, we were living in Hammersley and my wife was doing a couple of, uh, I was working a five and a half a day week and we had three small children at that stage and she would go off nursing on Saturday afternoon and I would have to get ready to travel uh, 50 miles, I think it was, to the church where we were serving. And the kids started to play up. And my wife was leaving to nursing and I was left for these screaming kids. And I got angry. And I really got angry. And I felt deeply guilty. And I said, God, 
I can't go over and stand before those people tomorrow after performing in anger like I have this afternoon. I went into my office and I raised my hands to God and I said, Lord, I'm not only sorry, but I claim what Jesus did at the cross. You know what? Within five minutes, I was free. And that happened twice while I was in ministry. And that's why I'm standing here this morning, because the cross sets us free from the past. Now, I heard of a, a man who was uh, in, in the gone by days, the old days, I suppose I'd say. And he was carrying a big corn sack of potatoes on his back, walking down the road. And he was going to carry these things into Saturday morning market. And you know how heavy a big corn sack of potatoes would be. Okay. And he was staggering along the road there, looking as though his legs were going to go under him. And a guy comes along on a big draft horse, probably a... Uh, Clydesdale size. And he says, there you go, mate. Oh, he says, I'm better than. He said, look, he said, this is a big horse. He said, oh, I'll help you get up on the horse and bring the potatoes up and you can set the potatoes between you and me on the horse's back and, and much easier for you. He went a couple of, he, he did that. He got up there went a couple of miles down the road and the driver of the horse looked over his shoulder and there this guy has got this bag of potatoes on his back again on his back and he says mate what do you do with those potatoes on your back again he said oh I thought I'd make them light up for the horse <laughs> See, we haven't given it all over to God. And this morning we sang that beautiful old song, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, is calling for you and for me. You know, it's claimed that there's not less than 40 times in the Bible where it says come. God's invitation has been there since Adam. And, that, and, and his call to us through the gospel and through his grace continues every day. Now, I don't know what's gone on in all your lives in the past, but God does. And the word says, I, the Lord, search the hearts. And there's a lot of people that may have a ticket to heaven but they're not being saved. They've been saved eternally but they're not being saved from themselves and that was the problem with the children of Israel. They were God's chosen people, called out. But they spent 40 years in the wilderness because they wouldn't believe the gospel. They would not believe that they had been set free by the prophecy of hundreds of years before, by the will of God and the purposes of God. And very often, we are under this bondage of not believing that our sins are forgiven. I want to read to you uh, uh, the words of a little song. I think I might have 
uh, read them before here, but they mean a lot to me, and I hope they'll mean a lot to you. And this song says this. Before the world began, you were on his mind. That's God's mind. And every tear you cry is precious in his eyes. Because of his great love, he gave his only son. Everything was done so you could come. And I believe this morning, if this is an average congregation, there's some that need to come. Either you're not saved, you've never been born again, you have no ticket to heaven. You may have church. You may have a good life. But this morning you need to come. There, there may be others of us that, yes, we're the Lord's, but we're carrying that bag of potatoes on our back. We're still believing the devil's lie because he's the accuser of the brethren. This song goes on to say, nothing you can do could make him love you more. And nothing you've done could make him close the door. Because of his great love, he gave his only son. Everything was done so that you would come. Come to the Father, though your gift is small, broken hearts, Broken lives, he will take them all. The power of his word and the power of his blood, everything was done so you would come. And the call of God comes softly and tenderly and strongly. But very often, People have resisted that call. And the call has come again and again. I've talked to so many people like this. And finally, that voice of tender invitation grows dim. And you find yourself alone. You find yourself coming to a, a new year, facing the same problems and the same hurts and the same bitternesses as you've been through. Now this morning, the topic from this chapter, we, we will have no chance of getting and digging out the wonders of this chapter 9, but let me say this. The topic for this morning was once and for all, and forever we're set free you know what we can add nothing to our salvation except our love for Christ and if we don't know that this is true that our forgiveness and the dealing of our sins if we don't know that it's once and for all and we don't believe it and we don't accept it, then Satan, the accuser, is going to have a ball. He's going to play Russian roulette in, in our experience. And he'll keep us under the power of guilt and defeat and failure. He took the full blow of sin. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And when Satan tempts us to go over our past and to dig up the past, especially if we've got things against people, then we can tell the devil he's lost his grip on me because I'm in Christ. And this great priest, this redeemer, has passed into the heavenly tabernacle. He now represents you and me in the presence of the Father. And his perfect, potent, 
powerful shed blood was accepted by God himself. Somebody has said this. Somebody has said this. That what, only what will satisfy the conscience of God will ever satisfy the conscience of a, of a man or a woman. It's so true. And in a minute we're going to read that reference again about the power of the blood of Christ. You see, all those millions of offerings and sacrifices and the, the Day of Atonement and all that happened under the Old Covenant, it was just a reminder of sins. It was just a reminder that their sin and their conscience had never been cleansed. But when Christ offered his blood, he gave the guilty conscience rest. And if we don't believe this, let me, let me say this again, if we don't believe this, Satan will play games with us. You know, we won't be able to pray. We won't be able to rejoice and give, give God glory. You, you know, Leon, that song about we're your church, forgive me for saying this if you have to, but I would like to see us all get up and jump around and praise God because it's true. And the heart and the soul of this church and the prayer of this church is that God will revive us. Right. Amen? And he'll revive us when we believe. And we tell Satan to go hopping because he has no part of you or me because Christ took all my sins and nailed them to the cross. I want to just read a few verses to you from this very chapter. And I find a great contrast, one of the many contrasts between what was under the old covenant and what is now in Christ. And it's found in chapter 9 and verse 12. And it says, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. Say it with me. Once for all by his own blood. Having obtained eternal redemption, the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremony, ceremonially unclean, sanctify them that they were outwardly clean. Now, no idea what I'm here this morning. That they went through these ceremonies every year or day after day when the, high, when the priests were ministering in the first part of the tabernacle. But in verse 24 to 26, it says that Jesus has done away with sin. The sins were covered for a, 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 for a short time or temporally in the Old Testament. But he, when he cried, it was quoted again this morning, it is finished, said a test I, paid in full. The deal is done. Tell the accuser the deal is done. Revival will start to come when we get caught up in this wonderful doctrine of the finished work of Christ. And then in that passage where we're reading from, it says how much more, if they were ceremonially out, uh, clean on the outside, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences? from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called will receive the eternal inheritance. 
Wonderful. Now then. You know what? I've got a thing about church clocks. They ought to have a guided missile, especially when you get to this time. Nevertheless, we're not here to stretch this time out, but to emphasize that it's once for all and forever that we're forgiven. And we are people, Jesus said, if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And we sort of have all self-conscious, personal inhibitions whereby we won't open our mouths and praise the Lord. You know, we had a, a German couple come to Christ in our first church. And they were uh, about to break up in their marriage. Uh, they had their own built-in bar in their homes, in their home. And they were on 50 cigarettes a day. And without me going into the details, they came to Christ. Now the father was in the bombing in Germany and he was a stinted child because he roamed the streets looking for food. But he had to come to Australia to find the food, the living bread of, of Christ. Now this man was so excited. You couldn't hold him back. And when he prayed, he would say things like this, Lord, Lord, save everyone between here and gels and cats and dogs included. Some of them need saving. <laughs> and when some of the women that weren't so excited about God was down the shopping centre, they'd hide behind the Wheaties <laughs> packets because this man would shell out, yell out, praise the Lord, and everybody in the store would hear him praising the Lord. So they duck behind big Wheaties packets, you know, like that. When we know we're free, we don't worry about what other people think except that we respect other people. But we worry about what God thinks. Now, in revival, when God moves, I, I remember I used to go to a lot of youth camps, speak of them. Sometimes they would be university students. On the way there, you couldn't get these kids to sing. We had this big 45-seater bus that we used to pack about 90 into lawfully. And on the way down to the camp, we would try and get them to sing. No way. It was like pulling teeth. After God had touched them on the way home, you couldn't stop them singing. Because when God liberates us and liberates our conscience and changes our desires and changes our way of life and our direction in life, we can't stop singing his praises. Leon, you better get some more parking lots done. Because when God moves, we won't have room. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to read to you a few verses and then we'll close with our song. I want you to come with me to Revelation uh, chapter 12. And this is a recording during a prophecy concerning the great tribulation that's fast coming upon us. You see, 
you, you see the prelude across this earth at the moment of the troubles that are going to come. And it's in verse 10. Now listen if you haven't got the word before you, please. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before God day and night, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens. Now, we may have trials and we may have tribulations. And, and we know while we're gathered here, people are being harassed in millions around this world because they love Jesus. but they overcome the evil one by the blood of the Lamb. That's how I've overcome him in my life, by the blood of the Lamb. There's power in the blood. There's power in the Word. There's power, mighty power in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and there's power in prayer. My brethren, dear ones in Christ, let's take up God's weapons of warfare. Let's take up God's blessings and God's provisions to be overcomers and let's move forward for God. The pastor's ready to move forward. So's his wife. You better be, Lori, or you'll have your husband after you. I'm not coming for morning tea yet. Oh, that door is definitely closed. Now, I wonder if, if you've been spoken to by God this morning. It's not about me, it's not about the pastor, it's not about the Church of Christ Church even. It's about God's invitation to come. And to leave your burdens at the cross. And if this is a normal congregation, there'll be people here this morning that need to come. You know, very often it's our pride and our, our self-consciousness that holds us back from declaring that we want Jesus to be Lord of our life and our decisions. And I'm just his messenger this morning. But I know this, that our dear Lord hung on that cross naked, being mocked and being scoffed by the people he healed and the people he loved. And he did it publicly and he did it for you and he did it for me. And yet when it comes to stepping forward for Jesus and declaring that you're wanting to be glorified in this church and in your life. We hang back. What will people think of me? What will my family think of me? But I'm going to ask you this morning, what will God think of you if you hold back from confessing him afresh? And I believe it's time for a breakthrough, brethren. And I'm going to ask any here this morning, the pastor's here and his wife, to encourage us and to stand with us. We're going to sing, uh, Leon, our, our next song. I want us to bow in prayer, though, before we go to our song. Let's all bow our heads, close our eyes, please. I'm asking for no looking around and no moving around. We're going to, again, hear the call of God. Lord, we're in your presence. And I don't know what's going on in all our hearts. I know there could be struggles. 
I know many of us have to let go and let God. We read those words, everything has been done so you could come. You might be a person that's been living in, yes, you have the hope of heaven, but you're living in defeat. There's something deep down that's wrong. There's a lack of joy. There's a lack of praise. There's even a lack of prayer. And I don't doubt there's people in this room this morning that are not the Lord's. You may have been born in the church, but it doesn't make you a Christian. It's only as you believe and you accept Christ and confess Him openly that you can know the joy of his forgiveness and his goodness. Father, we pray that you will hold the hand of every one of us this morning and we might just respond to you and respond to you in faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.